Something's wrong. I think something terrible's about to happen. It's a monster! This is the big one. Has it been three years Almost since we years, yeah, since yeah. we first fell in love? <laughs> uh, yeah, craziness. Yeah. Time flies when you're contemplating yeah. the end of the world, I suppose. Yeah. I think people forget that when you and I first met, it's speculative. It's just sort of like, hey man, I read your book. I'm just gonna take it now. <laughs> Do you wanna hang around and be a part of that process? It was a three or a four month creative process where we were just writing different drafts and I was just basically thinking, I hope this guy doesn't think I'm an idiot and that I'm ruining this book. I hope that he wants to stay involved because the show will be much better for it. Because my inclination, I always wanna kinda go into wacky town. Because it's fun. Wacky yeah, Town yeah, yeah. Is, is a great place. Mm. You know, anything can happen there. And you are more inclined to sort of stay in Reelsville. And I think for the betterment of the show, it lives in the kind of like crossover in that Venn diagram between Wacky Town and Reelsville. OK, guilty remnants. Can you all hear me? In white, can you hear me? Is everybody ready to kind of get up and slowly walk back there? Let's see what it looks like. Hey, Mike. Go crowd now. Fight! Cut it, good. Going from a novel to a series, the series is just gonna be bigger. I was such a fan of Lost. It was full of life and full of stories and they had this ability to look at this character, that character, and suddenly go deep with them. And that felt very novelistic to me yeah. in our world of the leftovers. I think particularly of the way Patty Levin grew from, a, you know, she was a figure of some gravity in the novel, but she was not an antagonist. What the fuck does that mean? When an actor is telling you what the character wants to be, if you are smart enough or lucky enough to recognize that when it happens and then you just basically grab on and follow it, that's the most exciting thing I think about television. There's an improvisational quality to it. You know, we're shooting the pilot and basically there's nothing behind it yet. So, so much of that process of writing episodes two through 10 was informed by the experience that we had while we were shooting the pilot. Lori! Lori! Get out of my way. When you look at the pilot, that scene at the Guilty Remnant house where Kevin shows up. Yes. Looking for Lori after the riot. Lori, it's time to come home. Jesus Christ, I'm trying to talk to my wife! And then the character Meg, played by Liv Tyler, shows up. I was wondering if I could stay here. You look at that now and you see so much of the show expressing itself in that cluster of action. I think I might be going crazy. We talked more about Kevin than anything else. There's this trend in television right now of like the rise of the anti-hero. The whole breed of men in their early 40s who have heroic intent but are deeply tortured, are deeply flawed. He's less of a peacemaker. In the book, he embodies this human desire to go on to keep things together. In the show, he is trying to fill that role, but there's just too much weight on his shoulders. <laughs> you watch this guy get frustrated over and over again, pushed to the brink of actual clinical insanity and somehow emerging at the end, uh, you know, not undamaged, but kind of with what he was hoping to get. I remember when we got to the point where Wayne says to Kevin, make a wish, anything, and I was pushing for, like, he should say, I, I want my family back. Just having the audience know what it was that Kevin wanted, and you're like, he doesn't need to say it. And you were right. They said they sent or are sending somebody to help you. When we wrote the pilot, it was like, oh, what if Kevin's dad was the former chief and he went crazy? <laughs> we might meet him down the road, and certainly once the show got picked up, we felt like we should do that sooner rather than later. We're in the fucking game now, you understand? I think that if the departure happened, that the entire world would be suffering from some form of collective PTSD. And a lot of people have compared your book to 9-11, and I feel like that's an apt sort of comparison. 
and just sort of tapping into that feeling that everybody had in the weeks following it of not feeling safe, of feeling like we'd been living under the sort of illusion of safety, and now this thing that seemed like it only happened in other places could happen to us. Was this God? Oh, <gasps> One of the reasons that the rapture-like event in The Leftovers is not the rapture, is because I didn't want to get into something polemical, you know, secularism versus Christianity. And what the story really is about is this mysterious event that forces people into a kind of religious improvisation. Certainly with Matt Jameson, he was a character that I remember you were very interested in, I was very interested in. Hey, you. Relatively early on, the idea came that he was gonna be related to Nora, but I'm not sure that we even knew it when we were shooting the pilot. I don't think we did. Doug was having an affair. Eccleston uh, had read for Kevin and just was dynamically watchable, but for some reason, the, the idea of him being Kevin didn't feel entirely right. And then he had said, I'm really interested in Matt Jameson, because he had read the book. And the book, Matt has clearly kind of defrocked himself, has left, you know, his belief system. And Eccleston started talking about the idea of, like, what if he doubled down? What if he became even deeper engrossed in his religion and was just trying to find a way that this wasn't the rapture, but maybe it was something else? I really thought he was going to be an important character in the book. He was upset because he's, I'm a believer. If there was a rapture, I should have been taken. Why are you here? It wasn't the rapture. They were no better than us. I have proof. The book turned out not to really have much to say on that subject. And then once we had this dynamic actor playing this role, he started to find a space within the show. And I just remember the phrase doubled down, and that really resonated. 20,000. Good luck. Later on, that was reflected in the roulette sequence. 20,000 on red. Where he is literally now doubling down on every spin. Congratulations, sir. We started talking about episode three being just Matt Jameson's episode and the idea that the show could kind of go off on these tangents. That was the idea that I was most excited about. All you have to do is aim right here. Just do it! I can't! Do it now! The sixth episode, Guest, the Nora episode, everybody was sort of like, I really love this episode. I lost everyone. I lost everything. There's something about Nora's character. She's kind of the living embodiment of the show that we want to be making. She's the most direct victim of the departure, but she's also really just striving for, what the hell am I supposed to do next? What's next? What's fucking next? Nothing is next! Nothing! I think it was really important for the logic of the whole season to get the viewers to invest in Nora and Matt. Giving them their own episode, I think, really paid off. In one of our very first sit-downs, you almost as an aside brought up the dogs as this thing that you wanted to have more of in the book. I think that I said something like, oh, I love that scene in the book where Nora's riding her bike and she rides by this guy, like, just sacrificing a goat. And then you started saying, like, oh, yeah, I had this whole idea for the woods. You know, the ghost of Nathaniel Hawthorne kind of hovers over the leftovers. In fact, the school dance that uh, Nora and Kevin meet at happens at the Hawthorne School. Oh, right. Uh -huh. um, but in, in a lot of Hawthorne stories, there's the town and there's the woods. And the town is civilized and everybody behaves well. And in the woods, there's all this satanic energy. <laughs> People wander in the woods and they see things they, they can't unsee. Out of the way, goddammit! Move aside! So the idea in the book was that these dogs who witnessed the disappearance, the bond between people and dogs has been broken right. by whatever happened there. And then Dean emerged from that. They are not our dogs. And I had a chapter which ended up just falling away. But when you and I started to talk about the dogs, I just saw you like... <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> light up. I was unknowingly connecting with a sweet spot of yours, which is about you know mythic animals yes. and dream animals. This whole part of your storytelling arsenal. <laughs> Any dog that bore witness to the departure just instantly sort of snapped and ran off to the woods and now they were all feral. I was like, oh, what a great cautionary tale for somebody to be able to say, that's gonna be us. Dogs are just animals. They just go primal, man. Same thing's gonna happen to us. It's just taking longer. By the time we got to the finale, we were sort of like, what if this dog is not feral anymore? So that chapter that never got written really became this highly functioning metaphor for the entire first season of the show. The basis for the stag was something that happened to me in my real life, which is when my son was you know, just a couple months old, and I would walk with him, and he'd be strapped to my chest in this Bjorn, and I'd walk through our neighborhood, and I came around a corner, and there was just a stag standing in the middle of the road, probably 30 yards from me, just looking at me, and it was just huge. And I just felt like, what's this thing gonna do? Is it gonna charge at me? My brain started saying, I will just go into the fetal position and, and go onto the ground and try to protect my son, but then am I gonna be crushing him? And then it just sort of trotted off in the other direction. But I remember just sort of feeling in that moment, this thing isn't supposed to be here. But wait a minute, we're not supposed <laughs> to be here. And those thoughts felt so leftovers -y, where it's a very normal suburban idea to see a, a deer walking down the middle of the street, but it's not normal. It shouldn't be normal. <laughs> The opening title sequence, we had a number of ideas. You had this very interesting idea of showing familiar Renaissance paintings with figures missing. missing. right. And I was saying, well, what if we had contemporary figures painted or illustrated in a kind of Renaissance style? It ended up being almost like a traditional representation of the rapture, but then also embodying certain scenes that almost seem from Dante. Not to put on my pretentious cap, which has a bit, very large <laughs> feather in it, by the way, but our show has to talk about religion, whereas other shows, you know, uh, don't really have to engage in that conversation head on. And so I was always like, I just feel like the opening title should use religious language. And of course, Max Richter came in and he wrote like a dirge. It was just very, very powerful. I loved it, but I also found it weirdly funny. Yeah. And because it was so intense. The show itself was set in kind of ordinary uh, American suburbia. And to go from that world to this beautiful Renaissance art and classical music, there was just this startling kind of disjunction between those, and yet signaling to the viewers, you need to think about this in a religious context. When we first were talking about the show right around the show's launch, the people that we were talking to were all saying like, whoa, the show is just so bleak. I just remember being completely and totally surprised by that. But once we started hearing it, when you watch the show through that lens, you go, shit, like they're absolutely <laughs> right. The show is incredibly bleak and, but fuck, we're gonna stone Gladys anyway. Please stop, please, please, stop. heartening thing that came down the pike is that by the end of the season, the people who sort of stuck with the show felt like you had to move through that phase of things in order to get to where we got to. And some people found it really helpful to use it as a way of understanding their grief or reflecting on it and recognizing that the story was evoking really deep and powerful emotions and taking them to a dangerous place. The pleasure that I felt when I would get the cuts was just excitement. I've never seen this on TV. I've never seen it in film. This show is doing something that it hasn't been done before. I have a reputation for, and I'm getting more comfortable with embracing that reputation as doing stuff that can be divisive. It generates a broad range of feelings over a spectrum, and it's all in the eye of the beholder. And to me as a storyteller, sure, it's great to make something that everybody can love, but this, it felt like we'd made something powerful and, and difficult that people were disturbed by in a really useful way. <laughs> All of us, no matter what we've suffered, Please help! we still feel pain. Christine! I don't want to feel this way.
Then let me take it from you. 